Underneath the beautiful greenery of Charlottesville's biggest park is an ugly secret. My ancestors and, and many others are buried here on the outside of the wall in these unmarked graves. A racist history that's been hiding behind playgrounds and golf courses is being uncovered. Penn Park is a 4,000 acre tobacco plantation. I had no idea that that's what it was. The city of Charlottesville believes this area is the resting place of dozens of enslaved African Americans. This place tells the story of how racism plagued African Americans in life and in death. There was no personhood, you were just seen as property. Well, you have African Americans now that are recognizing that, you know what, I'm doing my genealogy, and you know what, I want to know more. Diane Brown Towns and Lorenzo Dickerson have been identified as descendants of the people enslaved at Penn Park. They're among a growing number of African Americans who want the burial grounds of their ancestors protected and their stories marked as a part of U.S. history. It's like you are being directed to find them when they want you to find them. Lorenzo and I are a different generation. I grew up in a segregated Charlottesville, Albemarle County. Jim Crow was ending. I could see the signs that were being taken down. Lorenzo and Diane have been friends for years. And despite their generational difference, they're united by a determination to trace their family roots. I have been building my family tree for about 12 years. I've taken our family back um, a little over 200 years. I wanted my children to really know where they come from and who those people were. For African Americans, it's more than just about finding the names of their enslaved ancestors. My fourth great grandfather, Jackson Dickerson, whom was enslaved, it's important to me to know that after emancipation, he worked to purchase his own 11 acres in Albemarle County and became a landowner. It's also about taking ownership of his story they say has been marginalized. If you're just looking at history one way, then you're kind of not really being honest about looking at your part, the part that you played in. So that's what I'm doing, sharing my story. This is what I found out about my grandparents and my great aunts, about who enslaved them. Not to make you feel bad, to make you understand that everybody has to take some type of ownership. What looks like a family affair takes years of investigation by African Americans descended from enslaved people. It's not as easy as just going to Ancestry.com if you're African American. There's going to be a whole lot more that you're going to have to do. Descendants have to piece together clues from different corners, and that journey often starts at home. My great-grandmother had a Bible and photos, and um, they were passed down to me. During the span of 250 years of slavery in the U.S., the country benefited from the forced labor of 10 million enslaved African Americans. And families were often torn apart, which adds to the challenges of tracing African American ancestry. My family, from 1804 to 1835, that's about 30 years, they were from, they went to about 11 or so different plantations. So that's why we're split up. What can further complicate their journey is getting around what genealogists call the 1870 brick wall. That's the year African Americans were first posted by their full names in the federal census. Before 1870, enslaved African Americans were recorded as property and appeared as numbers. That's a whole nother emotional side that comes with this research. Dr. Shelley Murphy has dedicated 30 years of her life as a genealogist to help black people expand their family trees. When a slave owner died and there's an estate settlement and you got all the property, animals, furniture, whatever, and you have the Negroes as they're listed, but then there's an evaluation attached to it. In the absence of government records, the property documents of slave owners offer African-American descendants crucial information. So the challenges come with where are the records, who's holding the records. They're not all at National Archives. They're going to be local. They're going to be at courthouses. They're going to be at people's houses. Which is why many African-Americans are calling on descendants of slave owners to come forward with any records they may have. There's no blame to be cast. So we should be in conversation with one another and, and understand that history and how we are also uh, connected. 
Diane's and Lorenzo's families trace back to the Charlottesville area more than 200 years. But it wasn't until 2021 that they learned about being descendants of enslaved people at Penn Park. Virginia's legacy of slavery and racial oppression is long and bloody. The arrival of at least 20 African people to Virginia in 1619 marked the beginning of slavery in the U.S. In the early 80s, we started coming out here and we just hiked and children play on the playground. As a child, my parents brought me here to Penn Park regularly um, to play on the playground. Um, I remember it vividly, you know, what the playground equipment looked like. And just a short walk away from the playground and across a golf course is a history invisible to most visitors. Behind these enclosed walls are three cemeteries of the white families who owned and lived on the land through different periods. And then on the outside here is where the formerly enslaved are buried. Um, you can see the, the difference here. The enslaved are literally outside this wall, out of sight, out of mind. Among those buried in this family plot is George Gilmer, the physician and friend of third U.S. President Thomas Jefferson. They were the slaveholders of my uh, ancestors. The city of Charlottesville hired an archaeological service in 2021 after noticing depressions around the enclosed cemetery. The whiteboards temporarily placed on the outside mark where the service identified what could potentially be 43 unmarked graves. It feels like the spirits of the ancestors are calling you. But the city had a problem. It didn't know how to trace the descendants of the people in the unmarked graves. So the city asked me, can you find living descendants? That sounds like a tall order. And I told him, I don't know if I can find anybody, but I'll certainly try. Sam Towler is not a genealogist by training, but researching his own family history led him to discover that his relatives had enslaved at least 18 African Americans. My family didn't sit me by the campfire in the 1960s and say, Sam, let me tell you about all our former slaves at Monticello. I went to the courthouse and researched it. Monticello was Thomas Jefferson's 5,000-acre plantation and estate, where he enslaved 400 people. Sam says he had relatives who were farm managers at Monticello after the Thomas Jefferson ownership. I said, you know, I don't have any money to give, but I can give my time researching. So I started researching all the African Americans at Monticello during the Civil War. When the city came to me about Penn Park, I'd already learned how to do it. Slaveholding families often kept records of their properties and business transactions. Right after George Gilmer dies, his family sue each other over the slaves and the land. We found a list of 77 enslaved people. I wouldn't have been able to find anything if there hadn't been a lawsuit in 1804. That brings us back to Diane and Lorenzo. Their work, along with Sam's previous research, helped him trace the names to some of their enslaved ancestors. So Diane goes back to the Dickerson family at Penn Park, and Lorenzo goes back to the Dickerson family at Castle Hill, and then their mutual ancestor is Jack Dickerson. The city of Charlottesville has since installed a marker, but it's hoping to connect with more descendants before deciding how to further memorialize the burial site. It's almost like finding a treasure, uncovering an ancestor that you did not know was there. The shoulders that we stand on, they made it easier for me to come to Penn Park or to bring my children 30 and 40 years ago. Even after gaining freedom, the legacy of slavery continued to impact the final resting places of African Americans. During the Jim Crow era in the South, we had laws that were created that resulted in separate and unequal businesses where people could live. But not everyone realizes that that also pertain to people's final resting places. Lynn Rainville spent years serving African-American burial sites. We stopped at Oakwood Cemetery in Charlottesville to understand some of the patterns she had seen in more than 200 cemeteries she's visited. So standing in the center of the historic white segregated part of the cemetery, we see lots of evidence that more attention was paid to this area, starting actually with the trees surrounding us, lots of very deliberate plantings, and then the selection and the financial resources of these white residents to have these large prominent markers, these obelisks. And white people were largely buried on high grounds. 
In America, the high ground is considered to be the most symbolically important because it's closer to the heavens, but also for practical reasons because it's above the water table. And then as we come down the hill and we look literally down into the segregated black section, we can also see the pattern starts to change. There are fewer markers between that last stone and the small stone standing over there. You can see how the ground is undulating those are also graves, those are unmarked graves. Overgrown fields and vandalism continue to threaten the existence of African-American burial sites today. Lynn says, while it's not too late to save them, every day counts. Because on any given day, it could be a developer coming in to build new homes, a roadway going through, further erosion of the stones or vandalism or destruction. Outside the vicinity of burial sites and plantations, some institutions are reckoning with the racist systems they once benefited from and upheld. The University of Virginia is one of them. We are inside the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers, and this is just one of the wall plaques showing the names of the enslaved that were responsible for basically building this university. Thomas Jefferson's dream of establishing an institution of higher education became a reality thanks to the estimated 4,000 enslaved laborers who built it. Now, there's a monument that honors them 200 years later. Dr. Murphy is helping the University of Virginia find the descendants of some of the enslaved laborers. The professors, you got the hotel keepers and the local plantation owners were able to rent their laborers to the university. So what they initially did was track through the financial records and everywhere there was funds spent, you know, for enslaved laborers, then that's how we were tracked to be able to come up with the names that we had. Dr. Murphy recently identified Lorenzo as one of the descendants of the enslaved laborers. He attended a private event with his family to add the name of his ancestor. My uh, great uncle, Garland Maupin was enslaved here at the University of Virginia by a man named Socrates Maupin, whom I believe was a professor here at the University of Virginia. It is about time that the folks that uh, built this place, that built this country, get their just due. Dr. Murphy says she also believes that Diane may have links to enslaved laborers, but they have yet to make that connection. Diane hopes the names in her family Bible will help her learn more about her ancestors. This Bible has been around for a long time. I didn't use it until August of 2020 because we were looking for finding the enslaved laborers. But for now, she wants to honor the memory of her ancestors at Penn Park. They were Jack Dickerson, Suki Dickerson, Wilson Dickerson, and Edith Dickerson were all enslaved in 1804 at Penn Park. I acknowledge them, I honor them by saying their names.